<laughs> oh, I didn't see you come in. Welcome, friends. Today, I want to talk about the idea of masters in reference to the subject of initiation. Because I mean, like, the hot question is, do you need a master or can you just initiate yourself? And well, if we're talking about masters in regards to, say, high magic, mysticism, all that good and juicy stuff, well, it becomes imperative, it becomes absolute. You need a master, you can't do without it. But what is it that you can't do without? What are you actually getting from a master? Because it can't just be data or knowledge that you get from a master. And it can't just be a little bit of help or guidance. There's something deeper and more vital that we gain from being in the presence of a true master. The easiest way to explain it is to talk about the language of animals. Think of two dogs that meet for the first time. How do they communicate? You know, they sniff each other, they sniff each other's butts and whatnot. But there's more than that. Imagine if one dog is in distress. Does it tell the other dog through language? No. It's through its stance, through its action. Its nervous system itself has tension embedded in it, and the nervous system of the other dog picks that up through non-physical means. As humans, we have this faculty as well. Some people have it more or less, you know, intuitional, sensitive people. Empaths. But nonetheless, for most people, it's atrophied. Atrophied because of our language. We use language instead of this other faculty. Although you may notice it within yourself if you go to another country where people don't speak the same language as you. Now it's this faculty I want to draw your attention towards. When we're being taught by a master, it's not just words or guidance. There's something in their sympathetic nervous system which is talking to our sympathetic nervous system. Their body to our body. There's something direct going on. Fundamentally, the master is imprinting you with a new pattern of being. There is something in you that begins to mimic their energetic structure. And remember, matter or structure and energy and consciousness are all intertwined and interconnected on every level. So then it begs the question, how do you do this without a master? Can you even gain the energy? If you do gain the energy, can you even hold the energy within yourself properly for long periods of time? If you transform the energy, will it transform correctly? Will it move in the correct way? Or will the energy become stagnant? Will your structure become warped? Is this the danger of working without a master? And if this danger is real, and you don't have access to a master, what do you do? Well, I guess that's it for this life then. It's all a waste. Unless... You see, here's the thing. When you look at history, both East and West, you see people, you see masters just popping out of nowhere. People who are initiated by God, or by angels, or by bodhisattvas in the astral realm or something. This leads one to wonder. You need a master, yes, of course, but does that master need to be human? Okay, so, here's what's up. When you look at the Western tradition, what do you see? Like when you look at Grimoire magic, what are they actually doing? Well, they're all trying to summon angels. But when you look at the pagan precursor to that, what are they all doing? They're all trying to summon and work with gods. And not just work with or befriend, they're trying to become like them. So, could a path that uses ceremonial magic be a way around not being able to have a master? Perhaps, but let's look at this issue more closely. We don't want to be huffing too much copium. First of all, when people work with, say, the planetary angels, you know, they read a Grimoire or they read a magical book and they start doing the invocations and nothing happens, why do they fail? 
What is the magical mechanism that's failing here? Fundamentally, it's the magus themselves that's important. Basically, there is some internal work that needs to be done by the magus prior to this ceremonial operation. But it doesn't need to be something elaborate. You may not need a master like some immortal alchemist teaching you this. It could just be a little practice like, say, the middle pillar or to follow the guidance in the Yoga Sutras, or even the transmutation exercise found in books like The Secret of the Golden Flower. And we know this because in those texts that talk about, say, once again, working with the planetary angels, they always talk about a precursor, which is purification. There's always this need for purification, or for being pure, or for being, more precisely, balanced. And balanced is probably the correct word to use here. When you use the term purification, people think of it in like a moral sense, and when that do, that does have its place, but fundamentally, when we say pure esoterically, we mean pure like, you know, iron ore, or a metal. A metal that's pure is just one thing. We need to be that one thing. We need to be balanced. We can't be on any side of the extremes. We need to find that middle point, the balance point. Now next should come the question, how long do I need to do this for, you know? Do I do a five minute practice and then just start summoning angels or something? Well, this is where I got bad news for you. You see, there is no standard. There is no fixed human nature esoterically. We're all a bunch of attributes that are aggregated together. And even those aggregated attributes, that structure still has new things continuously being added to it. We are all different. So for some, something that would take three years will take another 10. What is important is that we try continuously, tenaciously and unceasingly. Patience must be acquired quickly in this work. If we truly want to attain in this work, we need to define ourselves to work every day, unceasingly, for years, perhaps without any results. This is a path that's far too dry for most people. They would much rather instant gratification. In truth, people like this tend to miss the experiences anyway. The expectation being that the gods will attend to them by parting the clouds with the sounds of trumpets. And those who do experience grand visions on their first attempts and operations are usually the types that are prone to say great delusion anyway. When you first connect with a being, whether celestial or chthonic, you will experience changes in your phenomenological perception but they will be subtle. That's why internal work is important, because many real experiences are that just that, subtle, not extravagant. And it's not even the visions or any voices you may hear that are important. What's important is the lingering feeling, the connection that stays with you after the practice is done. This, in a nutshell, is the art of theurgy to connect with higher forces and then to bring them into your daily life. And after all, they do say that your personality is basically a mixture of the five people you spend the most time with. So it makes you wonder if you spend the most time with angels and gods and celestial beings, what will you become? In conclusion, we work with gods, angels and ascended masters not for good fortune or protection, but to request that we become like them. Thank you for listening, my friends. And may the stars themselves stamp the seal of initiation onto your hearts.